Hello and welcome back to COVIDWISE Media. I am Nina, host of today's interview. And as you might have noticed, we're still in home office. We've been working though a lot behind the scenes on new interview content and we also got ourselves a new microphone for better sound. So if you've liked the previous four videos, we hope that you like this one with an improved sound even more. In this video, we want to have a look at how the COVID-19 crisis has affected different countries around the world. Needless to say that the pandemic had the most severe effects on developing countries. We've been reaching out to experts and are very happy today to speak to three different researchers that share their insights on how COVID-19 has affected Bangladesh, India and Ghana. This interview is actually a split project. Today, in this first video, you will hear about the problems that resulted from COVID-19 in the named three countries. In the next video, we will talk about possible solutions by social entrepreneurs and also the learnings that we can draw from these examples. We will start this session by first speaking to Robin Steedman, a postdoc in African cultures and creative industries at Copenhagen Business School. Robin is currently investigating the impact of COVID-19 on entrepreneurs in the filmmaking and theater industry in Ghana. To get a better understanding of the situation, Robin, what are the problems the entrepreneurs are currently facing? The entrepreneurs in film and theater that I was working with in Ghana and researching faced quite a lot of challenges with the onset of, of COVID-19 and particularly the lockdown um, in Ghana. And, you know, the fact that theater, for example, relies on a live audience. And when you can't gather and you're not supposed to leave your house and you can't be a crowd, you can't kind of convene um, an audience for your play, which which means that you can't then sell tickets, make revenue and run your business. Um, but interestingly, even on the film side, there was a lot of different challenges. So for example, um, film producers who had a movie kind of ready at the time, um, COVID, the lockdown and everything happened, were actually in quite a good position because there was um, a real demand from, say, pay TV platforms like Netflix for content because, you know, everyone kind of in the world is at home waiting to watch TV. Um, but for filmmakers who didn't have something ready or had a production they were about to start, the impact was really big. So, for example, uh, one of my um, interviewees, one of the filmmakers in northern Ghana, was just about to start production. So she'd bought all the catering, she'd had everything set up, and then couldn't go and do it. Um, so ultimately that was money that she then just lost, um, and now has to kind of start again in re-raising that capital to go off and make that film. And you know, these are, or in her case, you know, it's a low budget uh, filmmaking environment, probably making a film for something around like 10,000 kroner, but, you know, she had to personally raise that money. Um, so there's a clear kind of immediate impact of the fact that production had to stop, of that the country closed down um, on the way people could kind of keep running their businesses and, and making the films that they need to sell ultimately to um, keep going in their profession. How did these problems affect the existing business models? Did the entrepreneurs make any adjustments to the business models? I think the business models of a lot of these entrepreneurs changed quite significantly um, during the pandemic. Like uh, to take one example, um, a filmmaker running a TV station in Kumasi, which is the second largest city, I think, in Ghana, um, kind of had to completely shift his entire business. So for example, he you know, had um, a lot um, of viewers on his channel because everyone was at home, but he'd lost all of his revenue because all of the advertisers he was counting on kind of pulled their ad funding because they were all also local businesses in Kumasi and none of them could sell their products because of the lockdown. So he was in this very kind of curious, paradoxical situation almost where he was had, you know, the best viewers ever that he'd ever had and no money. So he transitioned um, partially at least, to a business selling masks and hand sanitizer, knowing that there was a, a clear demand for that um, right now in Ghana. Um, and this kind of complete shift um, in business models from kind of TV producer to hand sanitizer distributor um, sounds kind of really, really radical, I think. Um, but within the Ghanaian context and even the filmmaking context, it's not that big a shift because almost every film producer there um, also has you know another enterprise that they're running 
Like for example, there's something like a third of Ghana's population has started their own enterprise. So these were filmmakers, um, film entrepreneurs who are used to trying to think of what were all of the ways possible to generate an income as opposed to thinking of themselves kind of exclusively within the you know, creative industry space and as filmmakers. So while there were some kind of big changes in some business models, I think there was also been a kind of consistency in the kind of entrepreneurial approach that they've been taking even now. Thanks a lot, Robin. Let's turn to our second country for today's interview, Bangladesh. We are very happy to welcome Aaron Lighthizer in this interview. Aaron is an assistant professor at CBS and also a project manager for the international research project, The Relations of International Supply Chains. Lately, Aaron has been researching social sustainability in supply chains and especially how COVID-19 has affected the garment industry in Bangladesh. Aaron, what are the COVID-related problems that we see in Bangladesh and especially in the garment industry? Yes, in Bangladesh, I think we've seen a lot of problems um, directly related to the virus and viral response. Um, and then also its way of highlighting the underlying issues that have been a problem for a long time. So with specific regards to coronavirus, um, we've seen lots of factory shutdowns, but without wages being continued to be paid to workers, and this is critical for their survival, um, very hand-to-mouth uh, circumstance that most of these workers are in, so are faced with a very, very difficult choice about whether to go to work and earn wages or stay home and protect themselves from a virus, but then potentially face starvation. So um, I think the industry there was hit really hard um, in March in particular and in early April when retailers from across the global north canceled lots and lots of orders for clothing. A lot of the clothing, some of it already produced and in boxes sitting at the port in the US or in Europe, um, because stores around um, around the West are all have all been closed, so consumers can't shop in the same way. So there's been a buildup of um, garments and items, so buyers haven't needed to continue on their orders. This has put factory owners and consequently the workers in a really tough position where they don't have enough money coming in to be able to support operations, to be able to support the continued payment of wages for workers um, during this time of crisis. So those are some of the obvious things. Now, um, paradoxically, as some of the retailers have reinstated their orders um, and said, yes, we will take in these orders, we'll commit to buying new orders, The irony is now the factories aren't in such a good place to be able to provide health, um, healthy and safe working conditions for the workers. Many don't have proper hand washing facilities. There's very little social distancing happening in the factories. The ventilation may not be um, up to standard to be able to help with that. Of course, not all factories are like this. Of course, some are dealing with it quite well, but the vast majority, if we look at the data, um, are not putting workers in a very safe position. So I think these are some of the very direct impacts that we've seen, but these underlying impacts are, I think, even more important and the issues that they, un, um, that they underscore. So for example, low wages. Low wages have been the bedrock of the Bangladesh garment industry. Bangladesh has been known as the low cost country to produce, um, to produce clothes across the board. Um, wages just five years ago were about $38 a month, um, and now they're up to about $96 a month. But this is still really too low of a wage to be both a living wage and also allow workers to save for times like this. I think we've also seen how the lack of organization amongst workers in unions, in um, committees within factories, um, that this is really something that could be very useful and very needed in the industry because workers by and large there do not have unions. The number of unions are very, very small there. And so workers can't collectively go to their managers and say, we want appropriate hand washing facilities in place. We want to have every other workstation open so that we can ensure proper distancing between us. Um, so things like this, I think really, these times of crisis really reveal um, the issues that we have in the everyday normal. Great, Aaron. Thank you for pointing that out. As a last guest today, actually, I would like to welcome Dr. Shriva Sahasranama. He's a faculty member of the Hunter Center for Entrepreneurship at Strathclyde Business School in Glasgow. 
His research is predominantly focusing on innovation and entrepreneurship in and from emerging markets with a special focus on India. His current research is interested in how Indian entrepreneurs have been coping with the COVID-19 pandemic and what innovations emerged from this. Quite fitting to this research focus, we would like to know first what are the particular challenges that entrepreneurs in India are facing. If you ask me about the challenges that uh... India has been facing around COVID, I would say threefold of challenges, right? So one challenge is with regard to the large population and the densely sort of concentrated nature of the population itself. So this has meant that virus and sort of the variants of the virus have been sort of rapidly spreading amongst the population in different parts of India. Uh, the other challenge, though we have seen a lot of the vaccine, potential vaccination combinations coming through with approvals, the vaccination drive itself will be a significant challenge given the large population. So uh, the second challenge I would say is with regard to the divide that's there between urban India and rural India, right? So uh, there is a significant level of economic activity and quality infrastructure that's focused in the metropolitan cities like let's say Mumbai, Bangalore, Chennai of, of India, whereas large states which have large population like Uttar Pradesh and Bihar have subsequently lesser economic activity and don't really have those sort of big economic activity hubs. So this divide between rural and urban has posed significant challenges both in terms of response to COVID and also in terms of how we can shape uh, life post COVID. Third challenge I would say is with regard to digital inequality. So COVID in a way has sort of forced a lot of services and education and health to be digitized, which is a good thing. But then the fact that it has forced the change doesn't mean that the infrastructure and the facilities for digitization are there in all parts of India. So there is again a similar sort of a divide between urban and rural where services of digitization are not equally available to large parts of the population, which means that delivery of the services are unequal for a large part of India's population. So those would be the three key challenges that I kind of see as the current challenges that we are facing. And if you talk about how India has in general coped with COVID itself, I would say it has kind of gone through multiple phases, I would say. so. Initially, when there was the strong lockdown restrictions, uh, there was a big impact. I mean, particularly big impact on the informal sector, which employs close to 80 percentage of India's population. So you would have probably seen the news articles around large level of migrant labor going back to their villages, things like that. So the informal sector was just big time affected during the uh, heavy lockdown period. And subsequently, there was also significant uh, negative, almost negative levels of economic growth in terms of uh, in, in that period. But the sort of later half of 2020, I would say estimates indicate a slight recovery sort of gradually happening both in terms of employment as well as in terms of uh, economic recovery kind of beginning to come into place. Thank you, Srivas. And with these final words, we have reached the end of this first part of the interview. If you are now curious about the second part, so the solutions and also the learnings that we can draw from these examples, then stay tuned for the second part of this interview, launching soon. Thanks again to all my three guests. If you have enjoyed this format, please hit like, share the episode with your friends and subscribe to our channel for new videos. Feel inspired? Find out how to get involved by heading to our website covid-wise.org. We will also link the link to the website in the show notes of this video. CovidWise is a production by the social business model Panorama and Copenhagen Business School. You can become even more actively involved by participating in the CovidWise Ideation Awards that are also explained on our website. 